Her name is Dr. Joan Borisenko, and she is a world-renowned expert in mind-body connection, a psychologist and Harvard-trained cell biologist. There's a combination you don't see very often. Her work has been foundational in, healthcare, in the healthcare revolution that recognizes the role of meaning and spiritual dimensions of life as an integral part of health. She's also the author of a ton of books, I think 16 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Minding the Body and Mending the Mind. I could use a little mind mending. I'm glad she's here. So Joan, join us today. There she is. And, and, and Joan is one of the most high energy people around. Yes, she is. <laughs> We all remember her amazing presentations from last year's conference yeah. where she spoke on spirituality, neuroscience, and narrative. And I had the pleasure of getting to be with you for the whole day when we were live streaming your presentation, Joan. So I'm thrilled. In fact, I was channeling you this morning. Look at the colors I wore. You <laughs> I'm the one coming from Santa Fe and not you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great, great colors. We have lots of that wonderful burnt orange. It's the color of our mountains. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, we're thrilled you're here. And you're really kind of an anomaly, Joan, because you've got degrees in things that don't even go together. And you've got more <laughs> degrees than anybody I know. <laughs> So tell us, how did you get interested in energy medicine? Because you're a cell biologist and, and you've got all these other degrees. What brought you to this? And a psychologist. And a psychologist. That's and a psychologist. Right. Well, you know, I was working with Herb Benson. This was, we're going to go all the way back to 1978. And I had finished up my career as a cancer cell biologist at Tufts Medical School. And I really wanted to study the mind-body connection. And so that was my second postdoc was with Herb Benson in the new field of behavioral medicine. Mm -hmm. And one of the other fellows on the grant, um, this was a grant to retrain MDs and PhDs in behavioral medicine that Herb had gotten from the National Institutes of Health. One of the other fellows was a young physician who had been to China 16 times already. His wow. name is David Eisenberg. And he was fascinated with Qigong. Now Benson was fascinated with the relaxation response. And that was the original research base at that point in the 1970s that we had about meditation that it calmed down the sympathetic nervous system and it brought the body into this state of relaxation that was really useful because that's the state where the body can, you know, this is not scientific terminology, but the body can reset itself. That's mm -hmm. the place where healing can happen and it's the place where your conscious and unconscious minds are closest together. So it would be the place from where you would visualize, for example. And David Eisenberg was a skilled Qigong practitioner. And you have to remember that back in 78, um, most people hadn't even heard of yoga, forget about Qigong. Right. And he said, you know, Herb, I think that it elicits a similar state, plus it has its own aspects to it. And so Benson created a tour for the people in his laboratory. I think there were like maybe seven or eight of us. And we flew to China and we studied the Qigong masters. We went to a small village and we saw this demonstration uh, and the, the Qigong masters there, they took a sack of broken glass, poured it on the floor, and then they'd, they'd get up on a table and do a belly flop into the broken glass, if you can imagine. Oh and after they got up, there wasn't a scratch on them. I don't know. It was <laughs> the nearest I could say was it looked like 
the actual um, <laughs> the actual fabric of matter had parted like they must have jumped with their light bodies because their physical bodies were unharmed mm. that was pretty powerful and we saw a lot of qigong demonstrations distant healing demonstrations and david eisenberg got really fascinated and so did herb with some ongoing collaborations about you know the medical uses of qigong and now of course we know that um <laughs> qigong uh, actually of all of the forms of energy medicine has some of the the most robust effects including there was a a, a study done not that long ago at dana farber cancer center in boston uh, in concert with uh, uh, the Qigong uh, Medical Center in Qigong and the university. And what they found was not only could a Qigong master uh, passing energy to different types of cancer cells in a Petri dish manage to cause those cells to undergo apoptosis or cell death, but after the qigong master had gone if you put petri dishes in the same place on the lab bench where the qi energy had been sent the qi field still remained and the cancer cells would die just from the leftover qi field for up to 24 hours i find that really fascinating so that was the the beginning of my interest in energy medicine. And of course, at that time, we were just beginning to study acupuncture as well. So Qigong and acupuncture, these ancient techniques have, of course, now come into modern science. And that's always been the greatest excitement for me, is how ancient wisdom and modern science come together in the service of healing in its largest sense not only curing our physical ills, but bringing us into a state of well-being, bring bringing us into that state that positive psychology would call our best self, mm -hmm. and that I think of our spiritual self or our true nature. Wow, that's fascinating, fascinating. You know, I've been a meditator since my 20s, and I have to say, I've been through a lot of stress in my life. I think meditation's been my lifeline, you know, because I'm really one of the healthiest people I know, and, and I'm happy. So I, I didn't have any understanding until this moment, Joan, when you were saying this, that Qigong was so powerful. That's really, really interesting. I guess- Yes, it, I, think, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess- to of course, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm get so excited. I'll be quiet. No, no. I want to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> Go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, just trying to define meditation, Qigong is also a form of meditation because hmm. what you're doing is you've quieted down your usual systems of rational thought, and especially the systems of rumination. It's, it, it, it's a mindfulness activity that brings you into the present moment. And it is fascinating for me to say, ah, there's a common physiology for everything that brings us into the present moment. And then beyond that, there are special benefits to different forms of meditation. And people are very interested in that now. It's like, oh, I've got this problem or I want to develop this part of myself mm -hmm. and what kind of meditative practice can I choose? That kind of personalization of meditative practice, I think, is very important. Wow. Again, something I had no idea about. Um, <clears throat> when you say different kind of meditative practice, can you give us a couple of examples? Well, yes. Yeah. So, so for example, loving kindness meditation there's a huge amount of interest in that now 
And loving kindness meditation helps you to develop a character strength, which is compassion. Compassion for yourself and other people. Whereas something like, let's say you're meditating on a mantra. My mantra of many years, I like you, learned in my 20s to meditate, Paula, from a correspondence course sent out by Paramahansa Yogananda's Self-Realization oh, Fellowship. That's who I learned from <laughs> you, only in live, a live person. <laughs> I think, you know, he was, he was really the root of yoga in the United States. Mm -hmm. he, he kind of brought it to flower here mm -hmm. and combined it with Christianity so that it didn't sound so bizarre for people. So... Yeah. You know that was that was really pretty cool, mm -hmm. and um, in any case, the Ham Sa mantra he called it Hong Sa, is something I still use, and that helped me learn how to quiet my mind. The meaning of that was important to me because Ham refers to as kind of your ego, your separate self. Sa refers to the larger intelligence. Um, you know, the ground of being, God, whatever it is that makes sense to you, how you language that. And I like that spiritual connection. So I really learned a lot from that. And of course, you have to be mindful of your breathing. So concentration meditation has a mindful component, but it's very different than something like loving kindness meditation, where you're really developing a particular character strength then of course you've got qigong where you're working very specifically with life force energy and you know you're you're directing it you're taking in energy from the heaven you're taking in energy from the earth you're bringing them into yourself and then from that beautiful overflow you're giving that energy out um, I like to give it out to all beings and then take it back myself. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a very different practice of creating a chi field and connecting with the chi field of nature, the chi field of other people. Um, you know, and there are a lot of different mindfulness practices and certainly from the Buddhist tradition, very specific meditations that are meant to, de to develop um, consciousness of different levels of reality. I mean, meditation is not a monolith, it's all separate. But what they all have in common is that basic physiology of calming down the nervous system. And, um, you know, there's so much more research now on on the epigenetic effects of meditation and mm -hmm. how it affects inflammation and some of the effects on health that are separate from just what goes on in the, in the sympathetic nervous system. It also, you know, um, with the, the, this podcast is called the higher energy podcast. So these meditations also tend to turn off the, what science calls the default mode network. Which is the totally. part, which is this network of being in the world that's anxious and worried and um, which isn't what we normally would call high energy and then that opens up the possibility of all kinds of other things that's very true Bob that's a real doorway because that default mode network you know it's a um, for your listeners it's a medial network starting right here kind of in the medial prefrontal cortex and extending all the way to the back of the brain and the posterior cingulate gyrus. And back there, that's where our autobiographical center is through which we construct a sense of self. And we ruminate on that. Am I good enough? Are people gonna like me? Are they gonna put me out on a mountain for the wolves to eat? <laughs> what will happen to me? And so frequently that network is, is what John Kabat-Zinn calls it selfing. It's all about I, me, and mine. It's an ego first network. Um, and that's where the anxiety comes from. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. When you take that away, uh, 
you know, I'm kind of a transcendentalist and I love the sense that within each of us, we have a basic nature that is already connected with all that is, that is already wise, um, whose nature is loving kindness and mercy and presence, those higher frequencies. And when you get the default network to just shut the hell up, then like, wowie, as you said, you're connected to something much larger, much wiser. And that's where the guidance comes in and the healing comes in. One of, one of the things I like to sometimes tell folks is, you know, it depends on, it's like TV stations. What channel are you listening to? Are you listening to WFEAR or WMAD? If you're watching those, if you're watching those networks, yeah. you know, um, yes. I, I always joke with my wife. She's, you know, she's watching LMN, you know, it's, it's, it's always, you can all, I can, you don't have to even see it. You can just hear it and go, okay, it's Lifetime Movie Network. I can tell by this music and the <laughs> dialogue, I know what it is. And you know, <laughs> we girls need that. <laughs> whatever, but it's the it's a certain channel, right? And so the mind has certain channels. Yeah. And if you shut you know, it down, and then you but then you have to go somewhere else. And I think that's what you're talking about. You do, open. and it's scary for people to shut down the Lifetime Movie Network because it was built out of the very basic need to survive, yeah. and so that's why it's I think people talk about the negativity bias. We think right. about like, oh my God, if I'm not in my toes, this will happen, that will happen. And it's, that's the genesis of, of worry. And it's, you know, now that I, I love Rick Hansen's work. Rick is, I think Rick is right on, a very dear friend. He's the one who wrote Buddha's Brain, um, resilient, hardwired. Right. He's, he's coming to the conference this year. Yeah, he is. Oh, he is just great. I know. And his idea of, okay, there's a negativity bias, but if every time you encounter something of wonder, of awe, of beauty, of goodness, you stop to savor it, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. hmm, like a mindfulness thing. Where is this in my body? How does it make me feel like, ah, oh, my heart's opening, whatever it is, and hang with that for 10, 20 seconds you actually start to install that goodness, not state, but an actual, because it's installed in your, in your brain and nervous system. I think that is so important. You know, Joan, one of the things I think is wonderful about some of the work you're doing now, you talk about how we're so stressed and we're so out of sync with everything right now, particularly natural forces, nature, all of that. And, and, getting in just what you just described sounds to me like what I do in the morning when I take a walk, you know, just appreciating the flowers or taking a minute to notice the leaves that are changing colors or that sort of thing. Is that what you're talking about? Just kind of tuning into what's happening in the natural world as well? Well, yes. You know, there's been so much research on the natural world and like books coming out on the Japanese art of forest bathing. You know, oh, <laughs> I have to wow. say, I live in Santa Fe, right, right above a river, right on a river. And there's an oak forest right, right outside of where we're doing this interview right now. And it's totally private. Nobody walks there, nobody that can see. And as soon as it gets warm enough, I take all my clothes off. And I run out into that forest and I go naked forest bathing and oh, I lie down in a hammock out there to, to meditate. And of course, think about the energy of nature, the, en I mean, the energy of, of the sun, the energy of the earth, how earth and heaven come together. And like we're coming up into spring for example and uh that's the the first month of spring we're almost there the 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 spring equinox is the 20th of mm -hmm. march everything starts to wake up and then the next month you know you get past the awakening to the blossoming and here we have so many fruit trees it's old orchard land and mm -hmm. everything blossoms and then by the third month of spring, at least in these colder 
areas, that's when, oh my gosh, everything is bursting mm -hmm. around you. And whoever would think we would have lost our connection for that? It's as above, so below. We're part of nature. We're not separate from mm -hmm. nature. And just the seasonal energies in the spring, you know, the energies, this rain, it's kind of a heavy, moist energy. What we eat, how we move, um, even the character strengths that come up in us to match the energy of the seasons really make a difference. I think in terms of energy medicine, really beginning to, to move with the seasons, that's the most natural energy. We don't have to do Qigong or visit a healer. It's like nature is right there. And I'd say that, um, you know, by temperament, I'm probably a nature mystic, Paula. But, mm -hmm. you know, I finally take in that. What, one of, of, my, of my many books, the one that's still so very popular that people like, some of them read it, have read it every year for over 20 years, is Pocket Full of Miracles. And that, that looks at seasonal energies and gives certain meditations for certain seasons and various practices. And I've decided to really expand on that. So I've actually got a brand new program, which I think of as a legacy of all the things we've been talking about. And it's called Graceful 360. Full with two L's. It means being full of grace. Um, and to me, that's the highest energy state. And so we work with the energies of the seasons and the meditations and sacred rituals. It's all online. If anyone's interested, just go to graceful with two L's, 360.com. And I'm, I'm really excited by that. You know, even like the foods that we eat, um, where I live here, I have a, a hoop garden, and very soon in March, I'll be planting my seeds because the spring greens start to come up, and I like to plant four or five different kinds of greens. Then I get a lot of wild parsley here, mm -hmm. and it's like the body craves that, and it craves the bitters. Um, it keeps keeps your energy from getting stagnant in the spring moisture. Anyhow, I love that. That's the ancient wisdom too. Um, I'm so fortunate because one of my best friends and a dear colleague, Gila Rossner, is she's really an expert at Western medicine and also Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, herbalism, <laughs> and so she's adding all of that to our program. Um, there's even a monthly herbal remedy. So for example, I have the, the kind of temperament where, a um, body temperament, uh, where I tend to get spring colds. And one, one of the like herbal remedies for spring that I will make from Gila's recipe is like four thieves spray, which <laughs> will help help me. And then the greens increase my immunity. So I'll be like less likely to get sick. And I think Bob, just in terms of vibratory energy, um, it your own vibrations change in the course of a year. And in spring, I want to align with that. I want the sap to rise in me. <laughs> I want to blossom too, but I don't want to be laid low by colds. So I'm very excited um, about delving more deeply into those energies. You know, it, it sounds to me, John, a little like, uh, well, there's a part of me that um, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm not sure how the listeners will feel about this, but you know, this is our our society is so fast and it's so technological oh, yeah. everything's go 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 and you, you know, we don't do what you say <laughs> we're probably the exact opposite like you know we yeah. we don't go to sleep when it's time to go to sleep and we don't we just push ahead all the time and i'm i'm so i'm 
sounding to me like this is a lovely um, antidote or counterweight to for anybody that's starting to begin to wake up and go, you know, maybe I need to kind of tune, tune into me a little more. And, and how do I do that? Because there's so much, there's just so much information. How do I know what to do when? I, yeah. I, and I think we're suffering from that too much information and like, you know, how, what am I going to do? Which is why, you know, look, I'm 74 years old. I've been in this field for over half a century, hard to believe. And I'd like to keep myself in good shape. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've distilled what I think is really important. And, and I, I, I always, I know people are not gonna do everything. Sometimes it depends what's going on in our life. We can do a little something. Other times we can do a lot of something. But I've been trying to distill what is, what is the heart of the matter. And one of the hearts is, you know, to really just be aware and mindful of what goes on during the seasons. And then some kind of meditation practice, which is different. I've had a ball for the, this program. I've developed a new meditation for each month. And, you know, it's not like you're going to do all of them every day. But I think being exposed to different meditations at different times helps you. And then you see, ah, that's something I'm really relating to. So I think, um, well, one of my favorite meditations is loving kindness. And that's, that's the May meditation. Um, but the one in April is bridging earth and heaven. I've been working with those energies for a long time, just in practices of visualization. I love to bring those energies together in the heart. And I just frequently do that during the day. I'm breathing in earth and heaven and kind of breathing it out kind of as a, um, it, you know, it sounds weird to say, but truly, I breathe it out as if it's a blessing that I can give to other people. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that keeps us healthy is the balance of giving and receiving. So I want to receive those energies, but what completes the circuit is giving it out to others. That's, that's just so very important. And then you're part of this great circulation of the energies of nature. Mm. You know, one of the practices that you recommend, Joan, is Laura King's best possible self, imagination <laughs> writing exercise. Can you share that with our listeners? I can. It comes from the field of positive psychology. And I really, I'm a great fan of positive psychology because Regular psychology, of course, dwells on what's wrong, like, oh my God, I'm anxious or depressed mm -hmm. or I've had childhood trauma. And naturally, there's a place for looking at what's wrong. But positive psychology looks at what's right. And then it, it builds on what's already right. And it, in, in Rick Hansen's words, it would install more and more good. And one of the ways that you can do that was discovered by Laura King, who's a psychologist at the University of Missouri. And she started to do work with this exercise 20 years ago. And I think there's something like over 30 peer-reviewed articles showing its utility. And it's so simple, Paula. It's a 15-minute writing exercise. And you just write an answer to this, um, you know, this statement, okay, everything has gone as well as it possibly could. And then you describe what your life is like. And you can do it in many different ways, like to think about the coming year. Um, your life has gone as well, everything has gone as well as it possibly could. What would it look like? And I think you know, if I was writing, I would think like, oh, um, I'm healthy. My husband is healthy. The people that I love are all doing well. We're all in good connection. You can tell that what's 
most important to me is the love of family and friends. And then I would say, and my graceful with two L's, <laughs> 360 dot program is doing well, that what has meant so much to me is now helping others. I would think, oh my gosh, my garden really flourished. I, I, would, I got all this fruit. And there are all these areas of my life. And you can do that exercise in different ways. You can write about just your relationships or you can write about just your career. But, you know, ultimately you write about them all. And if you were to do this single exercise, best possible self, what's my best possible self in life? just four days in a row for 15 minutes, um, you would find that your well-being increased, your inflammation went, went down, mm -hmm. that you were less anxious, that you had more energy. And that's what we're talking about. These are things. And again, writing is another way of focusing your mind, cutting off the default mode network, opening up to greater possibility because, you know, we all know the possibilities are endless, mm -hmm. but we often get in a rut. So positive psychology is all about like expanding um, possibility. And they've identified 24 different basic character strengths it's fascinating. Um, this was the work of Marty Seligman, founder of Positive Psychology, and Chris Peterson, uh, another psychologist who's unfortunately passed on now. But they looked at the world's religious literature. They looked at the you know history of ideas and thoughts and philosophies. And they put together 24 character strengths that really kind of captured the essence of what is it to be fully human? And we all have all 24 strengths, but some of them are developed and some of them are not yet developed. So part of what I've been doing for the last several years is working with my character strengths. For example, I'm, I'm natively high in love. That's my number one character strength. Um, and I'm also high in humor. <laughs> when I use my humor, boy, when the chips are down, I get funnier and funnier because it's like how I cope. Uh, and I'm high in forgiveness. I'm a merciful person. But here's the funny thing. I love this. It's so funny. I'm low in self-regulation. What if I taught for years? Self-regulation. And I thought about that. And, and I realized... It's because by nature, you call me high energy, Bob. My mother used to call me Sarah Heartburn. You know, I'm so theatrical. I get into things. And very truly, if I don't watch out, I get into my suffering too. And I can really work up a big play about that. Yeah. So I realized I want to cultivate equanimity. And I've been working on that for a while. And every time... I have a little equanimity in a difficult moment. I notice it. And I think, oh, that feels good. Mm -hmm. I was able to really back up, be mindful, take a breath, take a pause. I like how my body feels. I savor that and install it. So I thought in terms of the things that I found that really make a difference for people, that's part of it. And so that's also part of my graceful 360. I want us all to be filled with those graces of what it is to be fully human because the world is so hard right now. And it's not the first time. My God, our world is not an easy place to live in. Um, I think uh, it's, it's always been difficult. That's what the Buddha said. <laughs> Even in good circumstances, you know, the first of the Four Noble Truths is things are unsatisfactory. That word dukkha, there always seems to be something missing. We're always trying to fill an emptiness. And I've really been wanting to say, I don't want to feel empty and like things are unsatisfactory. I want to feel like my life is full of grace. 
-hmm. And that's what I'm dedicating myself to for the rest of what I hope will be a very long life. And I do think positive psychology is one of the ways to really, really capitalize on that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of spring, um, hope, that's the, that's the first character strength. And, you know, we need hope right now. And hope is really about keeping in mind the image of what, what it is that you're aiming for. So for me, my aim is to be graceful. Yeah, there are a lot of obstacles along the way, but those can't be your focus. You've got to keep your eye on the goal. Um, curiosity is that I'm actually very high natively in curiosity. Why wouldn't I be? I'm a scientist. That's my thing. But that's uh, the second character strength, like for mid-spring. And the character strength that will work on noticing and installing in the last week, the last month of spring is love. So, oh, nice. um, and that's not when people tend to get married. <laughs> it's like a, um, when, when the earth is full of promise and bursting with flowers. And it's like, isn't that the great flowering of the human heart as well? Mm. Joan, I could sit and listen to you for hours and <laughs> would so love to do that. But unfortunately, we don't have hours. But if people want to learn more about Graceful 360 or you or whatever work you're doing right now, how do they reach you? Well, first of all, you have to learn to spell my name if you want to go to my website, <laughs> which is Joan, B-O-R-Y-S-E-N-K-O, Borisenko, phonetic.com. Everything is there. And there's you know, lots of podcasts and interviews and fun things. And then Graceful 360 um, sounds like exactly what it is. But remember, it's two L's. It's about being graceful graceful 360 and people can go right to that website and learn more beautiful that sounds great john one of the things i like it last thing about what you're doing with the graceful 360 i just love the idea that you're timing it to different things because one of the things i've been interested in lately is you know just getting that little extra edge you know, like you don't need a whole lot but if you do the right the right <laughs> thing at the right time it goes it. it goes easier why, you why, why, why fight the flow? Don't fight mm -hmm. the river, you know? Don't fight the flow. Go with the flow. And a little goes a long way. I think often what holds us up from doing things that we think, oh, it would really be good for me if I meditated, or it would be good for me if I changed my diet, is it seems overwhelming. But the fact is the tiniest little changes make a huge difference. Even things like when I started to eat more greens, honest to God, little tiny things right. make a, a, a huge difference. Great. Well, thanks so much, Joan. This has been um, awesome. It's been, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. And I'm excited to just sign up and listen to the podcast um because you've got great people coming on we're pretty yes, excited about we do and joan what we're telling everybody is subscribe review and share that yes. will be the most helpful thing you can do for us yes subscribe review and share absolutely i'll do that <laughs> uh, bless you right. dear. thanks joan How wonderful to have you take care bye sweeties it was wonderful <laughs> Happy uh -huh. almost spring. Happy yeah. almost. It's, it's warm here where I am, and I'm on the East Coast. It's like 65 wow. degrees. You guys are Isn't that great. Yeah. It's warm today, too, here. I think we're about 60, and the sun is bright, and I can already feel my sap rising. Yeah. Ah, very good. And California, what can I say? Uh, yes. <laughs> Always 60s <laughs> or 70s. Bye. All right, guys. Take care. So much fun. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye, Paula. Bye bye, Bob. Bye.